Welcome to the 10th episode of Critically Realistic. In this podcast, we are searching to address controversial issues that affect our life and society. If you find this content valuable, please consider to like and subscribe. By doing so, you are helping us promote open conversation in a time of social crisis. In this episode, I will address the topic of individualism and its relation to the health of society. As I will show, a new form of individualism has emerged, which I categorize as extreme individualism. At its core, I believe it to be one of the most essential philosophical shifts of the last decades affecting all aspects of our lives. On a political level, this form of individualism can be seen as the other side of socialism, reflecting the constant trial of the West to demolish capitalism at its core. By understaffing this topic, I wish to bring us one step toward reconstructing a healthy and prosperous society and its individuals. Thank you for taking part in my journey toward meaning. Individualism is an interesting topic debated in philosophy for millennials. At its core, it addresses the balance that exists between the individual needs of each of us versus our need to be part of a society. It is undeniable that each of us has its own needs, and at our core, we all prioritize our own survival. Regardless, the act of self-sacrifice for one cause is a known phenomenon observed throughout history, culture, and race. This human tendency reflects how philosophical we are as humans. It shows how the end goal we believe in can override our animalistic code making it one of the most important motivators of human actions. The balance between our individualistic needs and our need for a social life is crucial to human evolution, as it creates different variations of social structures and constitutions. After a long reflection, I came to believe that this topic can explain the essence of the shift we currently see in the West, a shift that seems to bring us all more suffering and misery than happiness and prosperity. Evolution is a natural and unavoidable process in nature. It is emotionless and persistent. The outcome of this process is no more than a natural advancement of one unit from the one that came beforehand. As a product of the present, we assume that evolution is positive as it brought us everything we know today. Practically, this notion is wrong as evolution and its wrong turn brought the extinction of societies and species. At its core, the process of evolution tries variations that survive by luck, strength, or momentary circumstances. One of the downsides of this process is that in some cases, a variation that survived based on the first or the last options moves forward and continues to evolve based on an unproductive or even defective base. The fact that history is a continuation of fallen empires and extinct predators is a validation of this point. The current state of the West is in decline and seems to accelerate in the last decade. The signs are everywhere. As I will cover here, I believe that the main reason for it is a defective aspect of the human experience that survived and was built over time. Not like other animals in nature, we are a philosophical being one that is led by proactive motives and abstraction. The argument I will present here is that the main reason for the fall of the West has to do with the loss of meaning and the twisting of our core values. The first value I will address is individualism and the role it plays in maintaining healthy individuals and society as a whole. If I am to put it simply, I genuinely believe that our current society and its leading social movements are driven by an absurd end at best, or, in many cases, no end at all. Let me explain it before entering into several examples. If we are to look at the dominant social movements of the early 21st century, we will discover two motives that encompass them all. Extreme individualism and hatred toward the past. Extreme individualism is a new type of individualism. It is different because it took the original concept and turned it on its head. From Aristotle's time, we could all agree that the good of the individual is what describes the good of society. Conversations on this topic have been numerous throughout history. 
The commonality of all was that while humans are, first and foremost, individuals who take care of themselves and their needs, they are all part of society. In this view, humans need society and have personal interests in ensuring they play an active role. While many philosophical arguments debate why humans need society and the best way to organize it, all agree on one principle. We are all part of society, as it is a need we all share. It is an important point, as by accepting it, we agree that the good of society is related to our individual good. Aristotle expresses in several books the concept of happiness related to the question of goodness. Based on his writing, good can be divided into primary good and secondary good. To simplify it, the first is done for the sake of itself, while the other is done for something else. In his view, there is only a good that is categorized as primary worth doing if we are to aim for happiness. This good is what we should all aim for and the only path to happiness. This distinction is crucial to this conversation as it lays down a fundamental idea, the state that not all our motives are equally contributing to our happiness. Additionally, he makes a very important remark. He states that a society is a reflection of its individuals, highlighting the notion that a society is a bottom-up structure, not a top-down one. By doing so, Aristotle paints an essential picture with several fundamental points we can extract relevant to our conversation. The first is that happiness is achieved based on the end goal one has. Secondly, only an end goal defined as a primary good can truly bring us closer to happiness. Lastly, it is the happiness and success of the individuals of a society that make it prosperous, not the opposite. An important additional conclusion we can reach from the statements above is that a society can reach prosperity and happiness only by having its individuals live and act based on an end goal based on the primary good. I will add here that I believe that only by having a primary good shared by all the members of a society can a harmonious and prosperous society be developed. It allows collaboration and trust to develop naturally and hold for a long period. Many years after Aristotle, the economist declared that humans do things from two different motives, diminishing suffering and pleasure. There is a big difference between the two, as one is based on avoidance and the other based on creation. The distinction between diminishing suffering and promoting enjoyment is an important aspect of individuals and society as a whole. Diminishing suffering on many levels can be seen as a reactionary secondary good as it describes actions that aim to handle momentary discomfort for the sake of another cause. On the other hand, actions done for the purpose of promoting happiness can be categorized as proactive primary good as they are done for the sake of itself. The difference between proactive and reactive is crucial if we are to understand individualism and what it promotes. Animals are reactive as they only and always act due to momentary urges while humans have the unique capacity to act proactively. From this philosophical point of view, humans who act without an end goal and are motivated based on secondary goods are no better than any other animal. Until recently, we could all agree that on an individualistic level, we all shared a clear end goal. Survive, multiply, and make sure the process continues. It worked well for all of human history as it made humanity the innovative creature that finished ruling Earth. The fact that humans had a common end goal created healthy societies that survived over time. Those values were clear for millennia to all humans regardless of gender, race and time. First, the creation and survival of one family and kids were the highest purposes we all aim for. Secondly, all humans understand the importance of the creation and maintenance of a strong society for the sake of security and productivity. Finally, individuals understood that collaboration was needed, led by the most capable part of society. The population that did not follow these principles felt various forms of tyranny, corruption or general degradation. One of the most remarkable developments based on these values is capitalism. 
as the term is not clear to many people today, we will need to start by defining it. Capitalism is an economic system based on values of property rights and free trade in a non-aggression framework that allows individuals to prosper as single units while benefiting society and its actors as a whole. At its core, it is a direct positive evolution demonstrating the balance between each person's needs and the maintenance of society that protects them. If we are to look at this philosophy by identifying its end, it could be said that the main claim of capitalism is that the happiness and success of each individual is what makes a good or thriving community. This idea works amazingly well when applied based on an end goal defined as the wish for a prosperous society. After all, the exercise of social economic practice is society itself. The balance held in capitalism is not obvious and has been challenged many times at the end of the 20th century. All sorts of socialism can be defined as trying to tilt the delicate balance between individualism and society toward the latter. In their view, society is more relevant than its individuals, their need or their capacity. Different forms of socialism approached capitalism from different angles, but eventually they all had the same philosophy in their heads. Individuals left free will not benefit the majority of the population or society. As history has shown us, socialism has been the main cause of death in the last 100 years and the denominator of massive starvation, mass homicide and general social degradation. The other side of this socialism can be described as extreme individualism. It holds the notion that the individual is not part of his society, but above it. This new type of individualism is different from anything we have ever tried, not because it promotes the individual in society, but because it turns the fundamental assumption of society on its head. It dictates that each human's main and only end goal is the maximization of their self-fulfillment. It is the most and only relevant aspect that matters. The definition of self-fulfillment is based on a subjective approach of a specific individual, reflecting his momentary values and feelings. Its direct implications are very straightforward. For people who hold this belief, whatever and whoever is not directly contributing to the realization of one individual's self-fulfillment is deemed an obstacle that should be avoided. This kind of individualism detaches the individual from society and, in many cases, positions him against it. As we will see, this kind of new philosophy has dire second-order consequences seen worldwide, making it one of the most important philosophical shifts of the last centuries. The fundamental concern associated with his movement is that it shifts the end goal of individuals from a social one to a self-centric one. Moreover, it should not be ignored because at its core, it redefines primary and secondary good. While old philosophies were based on the idea that humans' final goal is the success and survival of society itself, this new movement places the individual himself and their needs before society, making it the highest good. In this world, society's role is to serve the individual instead of requiring the individual to integrate and be a productive part of it. It promotes need and feeling instead of capacity and intellect. It requires blind obedience based on social terror instead of promoting an open, constructive conversation based on multiple ideas. The flip between the two principles becomes clear when observing the outcomes and actions of people driven by extreme individualism. Money, status, and dominance are hailed by people who hold this set of values. Topics such as politically correct speech, doomsday prevention and deconstruction are the leading social topics promoted as the primary and urgent problems we all have to solve. Society and its health are never discussed as it is a secondary consequence of the needs of its individuals. Money, careers and status are secondary goods as they are done for the sake of achieving something else. Regardless, in the extreme individualistic view, they are positioned as primary good and hailed for the sake of themselves. The creation of a family, the purpose of knowledge and the strength of a nation are seen as archaic obstacles that should be avoided.
Moreover, doomsday panic and politically correct speech are both reactionary movements, demanding the shift from proactive social activities for the sake of satisfying the lowest and more psychotic denominator of our society. Extreme individualism, at its core, is anti-social, instead of categorizing happiness as derived from a shared success defined by the creation of a healthy family and society. It positions momentary self-realization and diminishing suffering of its weakest part as its main goal. One of the side effects of running a society in that way is that its social failure requires a social net to support the breaking apart of society. The purpose of this social net is to feel the holes unavoidably created by diminishing societies with broken families and a lack of support for individuals when reaching old age. After all, divorced families require more resources to raise a child, single kids cannot support both aging parents, and society does not function without unity. If correct, the increase in the welfare state and the demand for more of it by younger generations is not a mistake or an exaggeration, but a real necessity to maintain a falling apart society. Extreme individualism can be seen in several parts of society today. One of its most terrifying consequences can be seen in relation to the population decline trend. I have no doubt in my mind that the drop in the birth rate, the rate of marriage, and the huge number of single-house families are all connected to it. The decline in the birth rate is a very concerning trend with a clear and unavoidable end, making it one of the most urgent and alarming trends of the early 21st century. While factors such as improved education and the liberation of women can be attributed to factors that affect this trend, I came to believe that the most important factor is the introduction of the values of extreme individualism to the West. The distaste toward nationalism is another reflection of extreme individualism. At its core, nationalism requires the sacrifice of one toward his society. Positioning people who are willing to sacrifice their time resources, and lives for their heroes. On many levels, it contradicts the notion that self-fulfillment is the most important aspect of life. Moreover, putting the well-being of society before one's own needs requires sacrifices. In many cases, it requires that one contribute his time and resources toward this goal, an act that requires on any level to hinder the selfish self-fulfillment of individuals. As I mentioned elsewhere, humans need a purpose. Without it, our inner world collapses into itself. I believe that the rise in suicide rate, depression, anxiety, and general unhappiness can all be related to the fact that the philosophy of extreme individualism dominating our current society is not only wrong, but empty of any true content. It leaves people lonely, angry, and frustrated. It is a philosophy with a twisted end goal that preaches to hate everything that makes us good as individuals and as a society. To prosper, humans need to believe in something bigger than themselves. The pursuit of happiness cannot be simply the elimination of suffering. Family, society and nations have been the cornerstone of human advancement since we remember ourselves for a reason. Extreme individualism concentrates on promoting secondary goods while ridiculing all primary goods ever worth fighting for. By adopting it, we are all racing to the bottom of self-destruction and misery, led by the lower denominator of our society. With all honesty, we cannot allow ourselves to live a life dictated by a minority of angry and unhappy individuals just because they scream louder. Eventually, we need to realign our end goals. Only by doing so can we hope for a better future. A society needs strong individuals who have the freedom to express themselves, reach their goals, and provide for their future families. We all have more in common than we think. Our society lost itself in the pursuit of happiness. We concentrated so much on how we wished things to be that we forgot why we were here in the first place. I believe that if we are to truly address our problems, we don't need to look far. We just need to ask ourselves why we do what we do.
It is all about the end goals we have guiding our daily actions. If you found this content valuable, please consider to share, like, and subscribe. By doing so, you are supporting my journey. Thank you.